Ice explains everything at Kenai Fjords National Park. Fully half of the park is covered by it, and most of the rest of it is influenced by it in one way or another. From the imposing and otherworldly Harding Ice Field to the watery wilderness of Resurrection Bay, from Exit Glacier to Exit Creek, I think it's safe to say that ice is the dominant geological feature on this landscape. Congressional leaders knew this when they created the park, specifically citing the preservation of the Harding Ice Field, its glaciers, the coastal fjords, and the marine ecosystem as key factors in the park's creation. Which is why I'm dedicating this entire episode to ice. Like with the Grand Canyon, being able to read this landscape allows you to tell its story. And at Kenai Fjords National Park, ice is the main character. When you step foot on this landscape or dip your toes in its frigid waters, I want you to be able to understand that story, to understand what this park is trying to tell you. I want you to be able to feel the weight of history and the power of geologic processes occurring on timescales barely comprehensible to our tiny little human brains. So join me on this journey to Kenai Fjords National Park as we explore its icy wonders and majestic landscapes, as we journey through geologic time to unravel the mysteries of this Alaskan National Park. 51% of Kenai Fjords National Park is covered by ice. 287 glaciers call this park home. The Harding Ice Field, the park's dominant icy feature, covers over 700 square miles of the Kenai Peninsula and is thousands of feet thick. It is the largest ice field completely within the borders of the United States. But if you can believe it, our story actually begins at a time when there was even more ice on this landscape. Our journey begins during the last glacial maximum, between 25,000 and 11,000 years ago. You might be more familiar with the term ice age, but either way, this was a time in Earth's history when nearly one third of its entire surface was covered in ice, including most of what is today Kenai Fjords National Park. In fact, the ice that covered this landscape at that time was part of an even larger expanse of ice known as the Cordilleran Ice Sheet, which stretched all the way from modern day Washington state up the coast of British Columbia and all along the southern reaches of Alaska. Ice sheets like the Cordilleran are continental in scale, truly staggering in scope, covering tens of thousands of square miles. During the last ice age, ice sheets like the Cordilleran were abundant. Again, they covered one third of Earth's surface. But as the Earth warmed and the ice retreated, so too did these ice sheets. Today, the only places you'll find them are in Antarctica and Greenland. But even as these massive continental scale ice sheets retreated in the face of rising temperatures, that didn't mean that the ice was gone altogether far from it. Today's Harding Ice Field is indeed the modern day remnant of the Cordilleran Ice Sheet. Ice fields, as a rule, are much smaller than ice sheets. They're much more localized, but they're still truly staggering in size and scope. You could fit the island of Manhattan within the Harding Ice Field's boundaries 30 times. At Kenai Fjords National Park, you can actually hike up to see the Harding Ice Field. It's a pretty strenuous hike and definitely not for the faint of heart, but what I loved about it was the ability to glimpse into the past, to glimpse into deep time. You could see our planet as it might have been just 10,000 years ago. Ice, as far as you can see, it seems to surround you, to take up your entire field of vision, to consume you. It is one of the most impressive things I have ever seen in my life, and I highly, highly recommend anyone who is able to make the trek up to it to definitely do so. It's about nine miles round trip and you'll gain over 3,000 feet of elevation, 
but seriously, you won't be disappointed. All right, back to the story, because we still have to talk about glaciers. Yes, glaciers. The Harding Ice Field itself is not a glacier, although it does give rise to a bunch of glaciers, about 38 of them. You can think of the Harding Ice Field as like the place where glaciers are born. So what happens is you've got this warm, moist air coming from the Gulf of Alaska, coming into contact with the cooler, drier air of the Kenai Mountains. And when these two air masses come into contact, the result is a ton of precipitation. In the warmer months, that means rain, but in the winter, that means snow. Lots of snow, like hundreds of feet worth of snow every single year. And because it stays so cold up on the tops of these mountains, that snow just accumulates and freezes, turning into ice, and continues to feed the Harding Ice Field and the glaciers which flow from it. I mean, seriously, there is so much ice up here. Like when you're looking out onto the ice field and you see what looks like these little hills poking out of the ice, yeah, those are the tops of literal mountains. They're called nunataks from the Inuit word meaning lonely peak. But yes, those glaciers, those massive expanses of ice, they do flow, they, they do move. They're sometimes called rivers of ice because under the force of gravity, these long rivers of ice flow down the mountains, scraping and grinding and carving literal valleys as they go. And this can be kind of counterintuitive, right? Like when you're out there in the field, you're not going to see a glacier move. It doesn't flow like the water in a river would. The movements are not perceptible to the naked eye. It's a slower form of movement taking place on the scale of years. We've actually been tracking this movement over time using historical photography and advanced measuring techniques, and it's not actually looking good for those glaciers right now. More on that later. But anyway, yeah, it can be difficult to wrap your mind around the fact that the valley you're walking through was indeed literally carved out of the bedrock by a giant moving river of ice. These glacially carved valleys have a very distinctive U-shape, which is easy to see after a glacier has retreated and just the valley is left. Now, these valleys are the first feature of this landscape at Kenai Fjords that we've talked about that aren't made of ice, but have been directly impacted by it. Now you can start to see why ice explains everything here at Kenai Fjords. Even when a landscape isn't literally made of ice, ice has affected it in some way. But we're not done yet either. Ice has many more roles to play here. So let's talk about rivers. At the bottom of many of the park's glaciers, or those that terminate on land anyway, you'll find braided rivers, or streams, or creeks. The point is, meltwater leaves the glacier terminus and forms some body of flowing water. But because of all the sediment that is carried by this meltwater coming from the glacier, there tends to be buildup or blockages in the stream channel from the sediment. So the river has to find an alternate path, and it carries the sediment into this new path until that one gets blocked up as well from the sediment. In this way, you end up with a stream that really has several channels all within the larger main channel. We call this a braided river, and it is highly characteristic of a glacial environment. Yet another instance of ice leaving its mark on this landscape without direct intervention. Now, so far, we've talked exclusively about terrestrial environments. We've talked about the Harding Ice Field and glaciers, these massive expanses of ice where it's pretty clear they're part of this landscape and have shaped it in some way or another. We've also talked about the U-shaped valleys carved by glaciers and the braided streams which emanate from their termini. But now I want to talk about the marine environment in Kenai Fjords National Park, which you guessed it, is also affected by ice. I mean, we haven't even talked about the park's namesake fjords. So how we were talking earlier about that Cordilleran ice sheet? Well, at that time when it was around, sea levels were lower because more of Earth's fresh water was locked up in ice. And thus the Cordilleran ice sheet and its associated glaciers would have been carving U-shaped valleys on land just like the ones we see today, except as the glaciers retreated and sea levels rose, those U-shaped valleys 
were now left below sea level. So they flooded with seawater and became fjords. A fjord is a glacially carved valley that has since been filled with seawater. That's one of the reasons this landscape looks so dramatic and striking, right? You have mountains literally terminating right into the ocean and continuing thousands of feet below the surface into these now flooded valleys. In some places, you can still see the tops of those mountains as islands off the coast. Also, there's a really cool thing that happens when a glacier terminates directly into the ocean. This is called a tidewater glacier, and they are a super cool thing to see. These massive walls of ice that appear to just float on the surface of the water. They're basically just like regular glaciers. They flow downward under the force of gravity, carving and scraping the bedrock beneath them, except instead of terminating on land, like exit glacier, they terminate in the ocean. And because glaciers are made of ice, they're made of fresh water, when it reaches the ocean, you get a mixing of fresh water and salt water. Now, this mixing occurs all over the world. The locations where this happens are called estuaries. Usually, this is like a freshwater river emptying into the ocean. But here at Kenai Fjords, there's a special arrangement. The freshwater is supplied by a glacier, and we get a fjord estuary ecosystem, one of the most productive and biodiverse ecosystems in the world. Fjord estuary ecosystems only occur in six places on Earth. Alaska, Norway, Chile, Antarctica, Greenland, and New Zealand. When tidewater glaciers, like Ialic Glacier in the park, terminate in the ocean, mixing with the salt water, they provide this ecosystem with nutrients like calcium, iron, magnesium, potassium, and others, which provide the basis for a massive, incredibly productive food web. Those nutrients make it possible for photosynthetic algae, called phytoplankton, to bloom in massive quantities. These phytoplankton are then consumed by other organisms, like zooplankton, which are consumed further still by other organisms like fish and marine mammals like whales and porpoises. Predatory animals like raptors or orcas then consume these animals, and there you go, you've got yourself an ecosystem. At Kenai Fjords, there are 191 different bird species in the park, plus you'll find humpbacks, say, and gray whales, orcas, dolls porpoises, harbor porpoises, harbor seals, stellar sea lions, plus all sorts of salmon and fish species. And you can trace it all back to a glacier, to ice. Most everything at Kenai Fjords National Park is in some way or another. Whether you're out for a hike at Exit Glacier, kayaking in the fjords, or taking a tour boat to a tidewater glacier, you'll start to see signs of ice's impact everywhere. It's inescapable once you know how and where to look. And I hope this video has given you the ability to do that, to read the book that is Kenai Fjords National Park. I didn't have time to include a discussion on the shrinking of Kenai Fjords' glaciers in this video. I mentioned it earlier, but the more I researched, the more I realized that that subject really deserves a video of its own. It's super complicated and really interesting and, and just needs to be taken care of by itself. If you'd like to see that video, do be sure to leave a comment down below. Also leave a comment if you've been to Kenai or another similarly glaciated landscape. These types of places are some of my favorite and I was actually there at Kenai for the second time back at the end of August. It's one of my favorite parks right now, and I could not stop thinking about ice when I was there. Everywhere I looked, I just found a landscape dominated in every possible way by ice, both ancient and modern, directly and indirectly. That's what inspired this whole video. Especially at the Harding Ice Field, that place left me in awe, and I would love to hear about your thoughts and experiences in parks like this one. Also, do be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the little bell thing so you can let YouTube know that you like these videos and want to see more of them. I tell stories from the world's protected places. That's my whole thing here on this channel. I'm just a dude who really likes parks and wants to share their wonderful stories with you. I also have a Patreon if you're feeling generous this holiday season. It is quite literally the single biggest thing you can do to support my work, if you are able, of course. And I greatly appreciate any support you can throw my way. It helps keep the lights on on this channel and helps me keep telling park stories for free here on the internet. You can check that out over at patreon.com slash nationalparkdiaries. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.